the world and she has been found. <laughs> it's like the sheep that was lost and has been found. Really? Um, exactly. So, okay, uh, I'm going to ask um, Chris if you would hit the record button. I did. We're good. And then I'm going to do a couple of bits of housekeeping, if that's okay. Um, because there are 60-some uh, 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 people here on the, the forum, please do keep yourself muted um, because background noise can be um, interrupting for other people. And I'm going to say... If you have a question that comes up, um, the first 20 minutes, I'm going to ask Canon Oakley to speak. The next 20, we're going to have a little bit of a conversation. Last 20 minutes, hopefully, we're going to have um, a little uh, question answer time from all of you uh, about what uh, Mark says, either in his address now or from earlier on in his sermon. You might want to ask a question about that. Um, and I would like to ask you to put it into the chat thread rather than to try and speak out. Um, I'm going to ask Chris Sanft, Joe Michael, and Susan Hotchkiss to monitor the chat thread, and I'll try and do it too. Um, but if I'm trying to pay attention to talking to Mark, I might not pick up every question. And so Chris and Susan and Joe may draw our attention to some questions. And then when we um, do that, we can go to you and ask you to unmute and speak. Um, but the best place to put your questions is in the chat thread. Um, is that all OK for everybody? Are we all good? I'm just going to scan my screens and I see lots of thumbs up and happy faces. And I see Victoria back with a picture that her grandchild must have made that looks really nice. Um, but um, yes, let me go back to um, Helen Mark Oakley. Um, it's nice to see you. And um, I am so grateful for you doing this. This is our, well, we did one of these already where I led the Dean's Forum. But you're the first guest, you're the inaugural guest um, from uh, far away in the United Kingdom. Um, and as I was saying in the church service, I've known you for about 20 years, maybe mm. a little bit more. Um, and um, I, I remember you sitting next to me once and saying, uh, what about this job at St. Saviour's Pimlico? When you were the archdeacon of, no, you weren't, you were the area dean of Westminster Deanery That's in right. London. And um, you were the rector of the Actors Church at the time in Covent Garden. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if anybody here knows what the Actors Church is, um, but uh, it's St. Paul's, isn't it? Yeah, St. Um, Paul's Covent Garden. Mm. In amongst the West End, where all the actors went. And um, so I knew you as the Bishop of London's chaplain, then the rector of St. Paul's Covent Garden and uh, Dean of uh, Westminster Deanery. Um, and then you went to Europe where you were... And this doesn't make sense to Americans because archdeacons are deacons who are in charge of deacons. Um, mm -hmm. but the archdeacon of um, Germany and, the, and Northern Europe, which sounds like quite a large territory. Yes, uh, a friend of mine called it the archdeaconry of the Reich, <laughs> which oh, is slightly, slightly worrying. Um, <laughs> I worked very closely with the Episcopal Church, actually. It's the only place... Uh, Germany is the only place where structurally the Episcopal Church in the United States and the Church of England work completely in tandem cooperatively. So um, I got to know uh, the clergy, the American clergy in um, Germany very well and came to be very grateful for them too. And to translate the structures of the Church of England into American speak, a canon, uh, uh, an archdeacon is kind of like a canon to the ordinary um in english structures not quite but kind of it's like a senior assistant to the bishop of that that area um was it straight after that, that you came back from there to um st paul's cathedral that's right yeah and that was canon chancellor yeah um, in charge of education and uh, arts mm -hmm. yes and now um you are the dean of chapel of st john's college in cambridge Mm -hmm. um, and that's been for a couple of years. That's right. Yes, two years, just over two years. And Mark has also oh, Mark has also written um, a number of books, most of which um, we linked to in the email that we sent out to you all. And I would highly recommend um, considering reading one of Mark's books. You're going to get a flavour of um, some of Mark's thinking now. Um, but I might consider uh, us using one of his books as a book club 
resource at some point in the near future. And we inspired will... idea. It's absolutely inspired idea. Um, I have an old copy of the Collage of God from like when you first released it. Um, but I, I think um, A Splash of Words is the more recent book that you've written, which is in the fifth printing now, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. These are a little more difficult to get on American Amazon than on English Amazon, but you can find them and you can find them uh, as uh, audiobooks and also, oh, can you find them as audiobooks? I was going to no, say. No, not Splash of Words. You can't. You can get it on Kindle and all that. You can get it on Kindle. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, I hope that's enough by way of an introduction. I'm just going to shut up and hand over to Canon Mark Oakley and say, for all of you, you can keep this on gallery view or you can put it onto speaker view if you just want to see Mark for the moment. When we go back to a conversation, you might want to go back to gallery view. It will be easier to see everybody. So um, Mark, over to you. Well, thanks, Matthew. It's uh, great to, to be with you. Um, I was at a, a conference the other day uh, when one of the speakers began by saying, as I don't know many of you here, uh, I asked for a list of you all broken down by age and sex. But he said, as I look at you all now, I can see that most of you have been broken down by age and by sex. Uh, well, I, <laughs> I wouldn't be so rude, of course, uh, but I can see you, which is the, the, the great... Uh, uh, the great asset of this um, 21st century technology we have. So uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm here to talk for about 20 minutes about the subject that um, is my passion, I think, really, uh, poetry and faith. I think they're two inseparable subjects, um, but I do know that as I begin any talk on poetry, uh, that poetry is a very scary word for a lot of people. Um, it can have really bad memories of uh, boredom at school, being humiliated at school because you tried to understand it and you couldn't, or you tried to recite poetry and forgot it. And then maybe later in life, you've tried to come back to it a bit, but uh, you don't know where to start. And even when you did, it, it appeared a bit incomprehensible. And uh, frankly, you don't get many words for your money when you buy a book of poetry. Uh, so a lot of people sort of give up. And, and there's even a word for all this, um, metrophobia, which is the fear of poetry. Uh, it's not the fear of the London underground. Uh, it's the fear of poetry, metrophobia. But to be personal, I remember very clearly the day um, I realised my life needed more poetry in it. I went to hear a British poet uh, who's actually a friend of mine now, w Wendy Cope, she's called. And she was giving a, a reading in, in the parish that I was working in, my first parish. And I went along and uh, liked her poetry. And then all of a sudden she said she was going to read a poem about her grandmother. Now, I was brought up by my grandmother as a child. And so my ears were uh, ready for this. And... Uh, the poem that she read is called Names, and I'm just going to read it to you. She was Eliza for a few weeks when she was a baby. Eliza Lily. Soon it changed to Lil. Later, she was Miss Stewart in the baker's shop. And then my love, my darling, mother. Widowed at 30, she went back to work as Mrs. Hand. Her daughter grew up, married and gave birth. Now she was Nana. Everybody calls me Nana, she would say to visitors. And so they did. Friends, tradesmen, the doctor. In the geriatric ward, they used the patient's Christian names. Lil, we said, or Nana. But it wasn't in her file. And for those last bewildered weeks, she was Eliza once again. Well, I listened to those few simple lines that capture 
the fragile life cycle of a woman that I think you've probably already started to feel rather tender towards after just 107 words. Uh, and I found I was crying. Uh, by the way, preachers out there, memo to self, you can do extraordinary things with just 107 words. You don't need 107 minutes or 107 points on an overhead projector. Now, of course, not all poems make you cry, of course, far from it, but what became clear to me that day and since is that when you're talking about poetry, in some sense, you're talking about a soul language, a way of crafting words that distills your experience into what you sense is a, a purer truth. And this is, I think, um, what the Irish poet Michael Longley meant when he was asked, and of course a lot of uh, artists and poets and writers are always asked this, you know, where do you get all your poems from? All these words and images, where do they come from? And Michael Longley replied, if I knew where poems came from, I'd go and live there. So that sense of the authentic, the distilled, the purer truth, somewhere that maybe we can visit thanks to poetry is uh, my starting point. I called the book that Matthew mentioned, uh, The Splash of Words. Uh, I gave it that title because I think a good poem is like a pebble that you throw into a lake. There's that immediate splash. So when I finish reading that poem names, the sort of stillness, the, the silence that might you may have felt, that's the splash. And then the work of the poem begins, the ripples, as it were, start to head out towards your shores and they shift a bit of sand in you and a bit of hard stones and so on. Uh, and that for me is the work of a poem. And W.H. Uh, Auden, a British poet, used to say, you can never really finish a poem. You can only ever abandon it. Uh, its work will always continue. Um, now, of course, in the church, we like to think we're rather good with language. Um, this isn't always so. I remember a very big poster in the Diocese of London where I, uh, Matthew and I used to work, um, a very gloomy church on a high street, uh, had a, one of those enormous signs in fluorescent green uh, that said to passing shoppers, tired of sin, then come in, uh, which wasn't terribly inviting, uh, and somebody at the bottom had, had actually scribbled, uh, but if not, telephone 642-789. Now, I don't need to tell you that for a person of faith, language matters. Language matters. And what I hate uh, about our present political climate uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, by the way, is the way that language recently has been cheapened. Uh, but I, I think that uh, for the Christian, language is sacramental, and we can, we can come back to that. I think we ought to be preparing our language as much as we prepare the altar or prepare the, the font. Uh, we, we should be reverential towards language. And whereas I think, again, in the church, we can get very obsessed with being relevant, uh, trying to be relevant to the passing moment, uh, it seems to me that the much more important word is resonance, not relevance. And uh, we might want to think the difference between those two words, but resonant is the word for me. It appeals to the deeper part of our humanity that is always there through every generation. I'm originally from um, a place in, in England called Shropshire, which is a very uh, green, uh, uh, cut rolling hills, countryside, typical English sort of countryside. And I was brought up, as you heard, by my grandmother. At the bottom of her field, uh, there are a lot of sheep. Um, and uh, a very old, wonderful man called Tom, who's a shepherd. And um, he used to, uh, he's a bit old now, but about five years ago, I saw him carrying his shepherd's crook. And I'd never actually seen anybody use one of these, uh, except my bishop. So I was joking with him that, um, you know, my boss has carries one of those as well. And I asked him, do you really use that to hook naughty sheep, you know? 
And he laughed. He said, no, I tell you what I use this for, Mark. He said, I, I stick it down into the ground so far that I can hold on to it. And that eventually the sheep learn to trust me. Now, I've been desperate to preach at the consecration of a bishop ever since, uh, because that seems to me a pretty good image for any uh, bishop to, to use your pastoral staff to keep yourself rooted and still so that you might become trustworthy and plausible for your sheep. It's also, of course, uh, uh, a good image for all of us as to how we relate. But it seems to me that if you're interested in language, um, then that language that is coming from the roots, the humus, which is the root of our word humility, uh, that's the place where language ought to be coming from that's authentic. And that's the language I think poetry is, is trying to get in touch with. And therefore I think it is a language worthy of our vocation as Christians. Um, we can talk a little bit um, later, if you wish, about those people who find poetry difficult and, and how we might approach that problem, because I think it is a problem. People get, as I say, put off by the, the idea. And I have one or two ideas about what you can do about that. But let's just quickly move on to the idea that if I suddenly said to you now, here is the news, uh, you'd probably all sit up and expect to hear the news, the facts of the day, events that have occurred, some commentary on them, and you tune in to hear the news. But if instead I said, once upon a time, you would equally be expectant, but you'd be tuning in your ears to hear something different to the news. Uh, you'd be ready to hear story where meaning is communicated, but without summarizing it, which is why we love it and why children love them. Now, the question I often ask is when you walk into a church, when I was sitting there today, uh, at, uh, uh, looking down in a sort of godlike fashion on, on uh, your church, when you walk in, how do you tune in your ears? Do you tune in for the news, for a Google fact finding mission? Or have you got your story ears on? Or what sort of ears have you got on? Um, I tend to think that people often come into our churches with their news, their Google ears on, as it were, because that's how we're using language at the moment, so often, facts. But actually, when, I, when they walk into a church, I believe people have walked into a poem. And that if they've come with their news ears on, they're going to get a bit frustrated because what you are suddenly immersed in uh, is poetry in motion. Um, I think a category error happens sometimes when, when people uh, come into a church with their ears tuned because God is never the object of our knowledge. Let's be honest about that. God can never be the object of our knowledge. God is the cause of our wonder. And you have to have different ears on for that. So you walk into this poem, this poetry in motion, uh, and just look what you were doing earlier. You stand and you sing a poem. Uh, it's called a hymn. Uh, then you hear an ancient poem, which is called a psalm. And then there are prayers full of images, metaphors and similes that are coming your every which way. Uh, scripture is read. I can come back to that. Um, even the, the, the movement is poetic. If you're, a, if you're a high church cleric or a charismatic singer, the gestures become poetic. Uh, your arms go into the vocative, into the invoking. And the reason all this is so obvious in a way is that when a human being falls in love, and indeed, as I look at you now, I can see so many faces. I, many of you may be in love uh, as I speak, not with me, I mean, but generally uh, with someone. Uh, when you fall in love, uh, you look for a language that's going to express what you feel and you will go to every length to describe 
how you are feeling about the loved one. Uh, we all become poets when we fall in love because we scurry around trying to do justice to the reality of, of what we think and feel. Poetry is the language of the lover, the language of love. Uh, and that simply is why it must be the language of the church, the language of faith, because we are scurrying around trying to do some justice with our words to the reality of God and the reality of ourselves. And that's why Rowan Williams, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, used to say that theology is, is us trying to say the least stupid thing we can uh, about God. The point here is, and this is an important one, I think, when you're in love, truth becomes so important that you can't just be literalistic. Literalism won't do. It has to become poetry. Now, just in case you think this is all a little bit, you know, a bit elitist, um, you know, I wandered lonely as a canon. Uh, let's just remember that all the world religions uh, have in their scriptures the poetic, you know, from Hinduism, the, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Bhagavad Gita, uh, the classic Tao of China, uh, the Hebrew Bible, um, full of poetic exploration in the Hebrew Bible, uh, the Psalms, the noble language of Job, the riddles of the Proverbs, those, those prophets um, who were always trying to get human beings to change, uh, they uh, were, were always using poetic imagery. Um, and I'll come back to the Gospels in one moment, but then jump to the Quran, where God is the poetic author of a text so beautiful that Muslims have developed a chant style for reciting it. Um, uh, you only have to listen to the uh, uh, the Arabic of the um, of the Islam's uh, Shahada, the Confession of Faith. There is no God but God. If you just listen to it, La ilaha illa Allah, you can suddenly hear uh, the double consonants, the open vowels, giving that rhythm. It's it's poetry in motion again. Uh, so poetry isn't just a better way of saying truth. Truth is found in the poetic form. It's not sugar icing. This is the essence. The Christian Gospels aren't so obviously poetic until you study them very closely, and then you see the artistry of the writers. And, of course, Jesus himself. And um, it's interesting, isn't it, when we say the creed, you know, um, the Apostles' Creed, that... Jesus was born, suffered and died. And you think, wait a minute, there was something in between. Uh, he lived and had a ministry and a teaching ministry and nothing's ever mentioned of that uh, in the creeds, what he actually taught. And I'm sure that's because it's rather difficult to paraphrase it. Why? Because he was poetic. He used parables. They're uh, very tricky to paraphrase and summarize. And that's why his disciples were always scratching their heads saying, uh, excuse me, could you could please explain that? Um, which is rather comforting, I always think, to the rest of us. Um, here's a slightly shocking fact to some people. You know, the good Samaritan never existed. Um, the prodigal son never existed. There was no Lazarus at the gate. There was no woman who ever lost a coin. Jesus made them up. Uh, he was a poet. He was a storyteller. He used similes and metaphors. He was persistently figurative all the time. Uh, and again, um, uh, we can explore that a little bit more later if you like, but, but it's always intriguing to me that when he finished one of his teachings, he would say, if you can remember what he always says, if you've got the ears to hear, then hear. And I often think he's saying, have you put those right ears on so that you can tune in, not to the news, but to the good news of the kingdom? So uh, I've nearly done my 20 minutes, but let me just summarise one or two things here. I suppose I'm saying God is a poet, and the tragedy is that, um, uh, and the troubles certainly begin, 
when people of faith become cursed with literalisms, um, simmering down the richness, the ambiguities, the resonances into black and whites. Uh, we do love our, our cutlery trays, uh, don't we, in theology and uh, faith. We like everything in its right place. Uh, uh, and the problem is that um, God continues creating diversity and we keep just making division out of it. But actually, the truth is that um, uh, Jesus, uh, his teaching and his preaching uh, was persistently poetic. And I think that was for good reason. Um, and my great friend, uh, Padraig Chuma, who is um, an Irish poet, always uh, says, whatever Jesus of Nazareth's death means, it doesn't mean anything that could ever be written on a fridge magnet. Uh, language is sacramental, language is about beginnings, not summaries, and, and God should never be a word for a bumper sticker. Um, so as I said in my sermon earlier, I do believe that God um, has given everybody this great gift of our being, and then you're asked to give back your gift of becoming in return. Um, and therefore, we need a language in our faith that's not so much about information, but about formation, a language that helps us in that project of, of becoming human, more human, more humane. So I do think that one of the reasons Jesus is poetic is because it's a language that doesn't so much set out to answer our questions as question our answers. Uh, we need this language that enlarges the heart. Uh, we get so used to prose, but prose is prosaic. And we don't want a faith that's prosaic. We want a faith that's poetic, I think. So my final comment really about, about this, and as I say, I could go on all night about this. And if you are interested, the, the, the book that I've written, The Splash of Words, is, has an extended introduction on the sort of themes I'm mentioning here. But then I look at uh, 29 poems uh, from different cultures and different times and, and try and open them up a bit. Um, however, my prayer as I wrote it was uh, lead us not into interpretation. I've tried not to interpret these poems, uh, but to, to give you know, a little bit of glimpses uh, and, and doors that you might want to open up if you want to learn a few more about them. My final thought is this, that the great mystic uh, Meister Eckhart once said that God is rather like a person who's hiding in the dark and occasionally coughs and gives himself away. For me, poetry is where I hear that cough. Uh, where my own snoring life is interrupted, uh, where that splash makes me jump and freshens and puzzles. And uh, the great American poet Wallace Stevens once said a very intriguing thing. He said, we ought to, to like poetry the same way that children love snow. Now, I don't know quite what that means, except I do know that when the snow falls on a landscape, it completely changes it in our imagination. We, we see it very differently. We have to work out which way we're going to go now. Uh, we need to work out new routes. We see our breath in the air. We suddenly realise we're alive. We're tingling. The whole thing has shifted somehow. And actually, there's a sort of quietness that's descended as well in the snowfall. And I think all those things are what poetry is offering the human heart. So when the Australian poet Les Murray once wrote in one of his poems, um, God is in this world as poetry is in the poem, my heart suddenly said, yes, that's it. Is that enough? That's 20 minutes. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. There's some applause going around. You can do the online applause if you like. <laughs> um, we've been talked about. We've been talking about that as a an ASL way of acknowledging thanks. Um,
uh, American Sign Language. Um, I, I do want to do, do one thing, just check that everybody knows that when you mentioned the cutlery draw, he, he was talking about the silverware draw. Yeah. Everybody got, you didn't do many of those. I was like thinking maybe I have to do translations. But uh, you, you did, and I said bumper sticker, but what do you call them? Uh, did we call them bumper stickers? Yeah. I don't yeah. yeah. Those okay. things that you put on the back of your car. Yes, yes. Um, I just wanted to say to everybody uh, who's been listening, um, did Canon Mark's uh, talk start you thinking about a poem that you liked or start you thinking about a line or an image? Um, I would love you to write into the chat thread um, any poems that came to mind that were inspired um, that you thought of when you were listening. That would be a lovely thing and we'll save the chat thread so we can keep track of it. Um, I also just want to say thank you, Mark, for a rich set of images, which is what I, I guess I should have expected. Um, the shepherd pushing his staff deep into the earth to be still is something I'm going to spend the rest of the evening thinking about because I try and be a shepherd myself and I want to know what that means. Um, the idea of liturgy as poetry in motion, the idea of Jesus as a poet, um, all of these things are going to work on me. So thank you for that. Um, and that, that's what I think poetry does in a way. It works on you um, as you are reading it, as you're working on it, it works on, it works on you. And I was going to ask some questions now and I don't know where to start, um, I, except um, I think what I'm trying to do when I stand up to read liturgy is that I'm trying to enter into the words and give them all weight and their space in, in, in the environment of the church. Mm -hmm. I think I am trying to perform a poem in, mm -hmm. in a way. I was really interested by the Auden quote you used that said that a poem is never finished, it's just abandoned. Mm -hmm. Is our liturgy in church ever finished? No. It's um, caught up in the eternity of God, so it, it continually uh, flows, it seems to me, and you shouldn't be able to summarise it, and it, it should have no ultimate closure. Um, so, of course, it's a language that's only full of hints and guesses and intimations and uh, all those sort of words that one brings into, into play here. Um, as I say, I think it's, it's not so much about trying to define God as trying to uh, call to mind the wonder of God, mm -hmm. uh, just as any love poem does. Um, so, no, I would be those sort of terrorists of language who <laughs> think that, you know, it must always be just so and like this and said in that way. I, I, I totally disagree. I, I believe in the tradition. I believe that that words can can uh, speak through generations uh, and can you know revitalize through each and every generation. But I do think we ought to be uh, very attentive to the language we're using. There's nothing worse than a somebody leading worship who's gone on autopilot mm. uh, and everything's become deadened. Uh, and I'm afraid, as I've done rounds of churches, you know, we've probably all been there, some, somebody, you know, droning on with these words, making them completely lifeless. And, and I must say today, I, I was very impressed, um, not only by yourself, but by everybody who was speaking words. I thought, I thought there was a lovely attentiveness to the language that you've been privileged to, to inherit as, as a Christian community. Um, I could hear the, the people engaging with what they were saying. And you're, you're, that's great because you don't always get that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a gift of this cathedral. I think people um, do, do have a love of the words and think of the words not as flat on the page, but as living. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think therefore needing to be weighed, paced, treated with respect. Um, yes. Please. I'll give you a, a fun little example when I was in St. Paul's Cathedral, how the whole theology of things can change with just one stress. OK, so in an ordination service, we used to have lots of them at St. Paul's. I remember I was there once. You were there once. So one of the readings is Isaiah 6. And, you're, and it always ends. 
ends. There they all are, the people just about to be ordained. It always ends with that line, here am I, send me. Mm-hmm. And one of the candidates would always read it. And I, 90% of the time, they would read it like this. Here am I, send me. And everybody used to go, oh, you know, send me. You know, it was all about... And every, it was their ordination day, and it was all focused. But actually, you could argue that the stress shouldn't be on me there. The emphasis should be on send. Here am I, send me. Because <laughs> mm-hmm. the ordination theology really is not so much about you. It's about being sent. Yeah. So the whole theology of ordination, it seemed to, I used to joke with this with when, I, when I used to do some teaching of uh, seminaries, is that um, the whole theology of ordination was in the balance over which way they were going to stress one word in one sentence at the end. And, you know, being attentive to how you're using language is very significant sometimes. Thank you. I, I've, I preached the entire sermon on the placement of a comma in um, a passage from Isaiah and how it totally changes the meaning of the text. Um, I I feel that. Um, At St. Paul's Cathedral, you try to take the internal conversation that we're having inside the church and make it a public conversation. I wonder what blessings and what challenges you found in that uh, endeavor. (laughs) Good question. I've spent a bit of time in the States. Um, I wrote I wrote the special words in New York. Um, I think the UK and America are rather different culturally on religion and the public. I think it's probably shifting in America from what I can tell you. You can tell me about this more. But religion is not something in the public domain in Britain. It's a rather vulgar subject to talk about. Uh, Tony Blair famously said, we don't do God. Strangely, he did. Uh, He converted to Roman Catholicism, but he didn't do it publicly. And uh, and so it's a subject that that you can't easily bring up in the public domain. Um... So what's a cathedral trying to do, like London, where I was, or maybe for you, you know, how are you trying to find a language that is plausible, um, that is interesting, without it sounding uh, either fantastical or um, dull? (laughs) Mm -hmm. So we were always trying to find subjects of mutual concern where the the christian community might have something or an angle specifically to bring that maybe the secular world and secular thinking was not or had forgotten rowan williams is an excellent person at doing that Um, he finds a language that isn't defensive so it's not the church on the defense uh, that nothing's less attractive (laughs) That's awful. And as Marilyn Robinson said, nothing will ever be uh, said um, truthfully about God from a defensive posture. So we were always trying to find a positive way of engaging with whoever it was, whatever community it was, whatever subject it was, in a hospitable way. Um, But the challenge is, is that quite often the people, the the communities, the causes that we were trying to have a dialogue with, they often would come to the cathedral wondering whether we were their friend or their foe. Uh, So for I'll give you an example. I started when I was there a a service for those who had suffered hate crime due to whatever it might be. Might be their sexual orientation, it may be their disability, it may be their religion, whatever. And it was we did it on in uh, uh, hate crime awareness week. It's called in Britain. 
And those people who we invited, I, I remember them so vividly on that first night, just not knowing whether they were coming into a safe space, because this church represented for many of them uh, unsafety and uh, discrimination, even hate. Um, now, that was a good example that I think it took us three or four years of having that service before some trust was being built up through hopefully by the way we were talking together, but also behaving. Um, so I, I think you need a lot of patience. You need um, a lot of attentiveness to your language again. Uh, and you need a very hospitable, generous uh, spirit when you engage in the public domain in Britain. Because um, nobody's going to just sit there and listen to you because you're the church anymore that those days have gone. Mm -hmm. The only thing they will listen to is if you're going to bring wisdom to the table uh, that sounds as if it might have some authenticity to it. And we've got it. Brothers and sisters, we have got it. <laughs> Let us not be embarrassed about it, but we do have to find ways of expressing it that don't sound as if they're know-it-all. <laughs> Thank you for that. I, I appreciate that. Um, we are, I think probably the church in California is not as distant from the church that you just described in England as mm -hmm. in other parts of the US um, culturally. We, religion isn't spoken of quite as publicly um, here. Um, and I think that there's some, some wisdom to learn from what you've, you've said. Um, I, I appreciate that. I've got like 19 other questions. I'm gonna stop though, um, because I'd like to see um, if there are some questions coming from the gathered group here. Um, and this conversation could go on for a, a long time, I'm sure, um, but we're gonna kind of try and keep it focused to an hour. Um, and so I wonder if um, Chris or Susan or Joe has spotted any questions that they would like to draw to mine and Mark's attention. Um, in the chat thread. I didn't see any questions and there was a, a number of references to poetry um, and then there's a couple references for Mark's books. Um, I saw that somebody was asking about the name of the author of the of the poem I read and the name of the poem. Uh, it's actually the first poem I I quote and I put out in my splash of words book but the poem is called Names and the poet is called Wendy Cope, C-O-P-E. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, your decision to write today's remarkable moving sermon in second person, mm -hmm. the you perspective. There's a oh, question. Naomi, would you like to unmute and ask your question in person? Naomi Williams. Hi. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm new, so I'm, I'm feeling a little sheepish about speaking up. But hello, this is awesome. Go sheepish I, and do it anyway. All right. Um, I, I'm, on, I'm a novelist here in Sacramento, a novel, a prose writer who loves poetry and finds it essential. Um, but I was so struck by your decision to to tell today's story mostly in second person, that you perspective, that um, you know we often warn student writers to be very careful of, <laughs> but it has its uses, and I just love to hear you talk about your decision to do that. I've never done it before, um, and preachers always need to find um, a way of getting beyond the things they think they're good at. <laughs> so, you know, we can find a form of preaching that, you know, probably works sufficiently well, but occasionally I think we ought to try something different. Um, <laughs> I thought to myself, well, if it doesn't work, I'm on the other side of the world to most of them. <laughs> Won't see them ever again. Um, I didn't quite think that. I just, I just actually thought, well, They've invited me uh, to do this. It's quite exciting, this adventure. Let me try something a bit different. And uh, 
I suppose I wanted to, to give you as the listener the sense that you were overhearing me. And it might have been a different sermon if I just told you directly what was going on. I wanted you to get a sense that the whole thing had started up or intensified some thinking within and some, some talking to God. <laughs> and you were going to overhear it a bit. That's why I tried it out. Whether um, it worked or not, I don't know. But anyway, I tried that. Did, did the whole, like, I'm a preacher. I, I think of context. I think of where I'm going to be and who I'm speaking to. Did mm. the fact that you were sitting in your study whilst on a video screen in another country using technology to communicate shape some of those choices? I don't think so. I think I could have done that if I were with you. Um, I, I don't like preaching, by the way, on like, like this. Um, I much prefer to be with people. I have a very strong belief that, an, that a sermon isn't a text, it's an event. Mm -hmm. And an event that has human physicality as part of it. So I do think something is diminished by the screen experience. Um, I mean, screen is an interesting word in itself, isn't it? It's screening out something uh, as well as opening up. Uh, so I do, I do feel slightly contained, imprisoned even by the experience of preaching on a, on a camera. However, you know, there are, there's a wonderful side to it as well. I mean, I, would, I wouldn't have flown over to you <laughs> to preach a sermon um, or, or to do this. Um, and here we are. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, the COVID period has cut some options off and opened some things up. And mm -hmm. then I think it's one of our jobs to figure out what we do with that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm... I'm grateful for you being willing to enter into the experiment of this morning for that. Um, I'm going to go to another comment. Um, and that is um, a quizzical question for me. What happens to a dream deferred that Catherine Bowler has asked? And I'm not sure of exactly what you're referring to, Catherine. So would you like to unmute and ask that? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Catherine. Um, hi, that's the poet Langston Hughes. The Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? The Harlem Renaissance poet. That's the first line of his poem. What, what happens, happens to, to, a dream? to a dream deferred? Oh, so you're, quote, you're quoting a poem, but also it happens to be a question. We I, I tried to type Hughes and I pressed enter. I tried okay. to type his name. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Mark, what happens to a dream deferred? It becomes oh. Black Lives Matter. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I'm often saying to to um, uh, ordinands and seminarians uh, that Martin Luther King never once said, you know, I have a nightmare. <laughs> he, he said, I have a dream, and it's the dream that's the invitation. Uh, sometimes the dreams are deferred. It doesn't mean they're, they're disappeared. And um, uh, that's, and again, I mean, if you want to talk about poetry, just think of Martin Luther King's preaching uh, and, and words. It's, there's more poetry in motion. Um, yes, I thought it was, it, it's Langston Hughes, is it? The, yeah, I thought it was. The other extraordinary thing that happened, uh, just talking about Black Lives Matter, when I was um, in the States writing this book, uh, there was a, um, a black guy who'd been shot dead. And I went to visit the, the sort of street vigil that they had set up where he'd been killed. And I saw uh, a brown box that had been painted on. And it simply said, 
Um, they tried to bury us, but they forgot we are seeds. Mm. And I was intrigued by that. So I looked it up and um, it had been used by certain Mexican uh, liberation groups in the 70s. But actually it was, it was a line that came from a Greek poet who was, uh, who was gay and uh, had lived in fear of being um, thrown out of the cultural community because of his sexual orientation. And um, he had actually said, uh, they tried to bury me, but they forgot I am a seed. And I, I was rather haunted by this actually, because if you want to talk about you know dreams deferred, um, but also about how this one line of a poem from somebody in Greece passed to Mexico <laughs> to liberation groups and ended up on the streets um, commemorating the death of a black guy in New York, just outside New York. Uh, again, more poetry in motion. Nothing was stronger, it seemed to me, than, than painting these words on a box. And it, it, was, it was, well, it, gave shivers down my spine really and it's a it's a sentence by the way i've since used in a in a sermon for easter i like that um we've we've drifted into conversations about language as protests mm. language as resistance mm. um and sometimes our language is not necessarily always about love compassion God as love, what that means. Sometimes there is there is challenge and darkness in it, um, and that's been the case in our church as well, um, and still is to an extent. I, I I think that the we've just finished Black History Month and we've been thinking about that as a cathedral um, in conversation. Um, issues around human sexuality and gender are always are also areas where we are in conflict and I don't really know if I have a question there but my, my question is how can the how can the language of love also be language of justice and resistance hmm. so that's a question I took a question back I'm sorry everyone well I think justice is part of love um, it's a sort of it's the social enactment of love um, so I wouldn't want to separate them too much. I think it comes out of a, a love of humanity that you you demand justice. Of course, the other thing we've got to remember is just because you're angry doesn't mean you're a prophet. Um, so that you, your anger has to be channeled and uh, constructively used, rather than combatively used in it for its own sake. It's a purposeful anger i mean the anger of jesus in the temple we heard in the gospel today um is something that i think comes out of a love actually and i think any pair i'm not a parent but you know parents will tell me that the reason they often get angry uh, is out of their love for their children um that they don't want this to happen to them or, or so on so i think that um the language of protest is um it's something I, well, it's interesting. I work with students at the moment. I think it's starting to come into play again a little bit more than it has. It's been a bit dormant, but I think there's so much to be angry about. <laughs> it's starting to emerge again. Um, and uh, again, it, you will find that poetry is the way people will often do it um, because it is the language that, that reaches the intellect by way of the heart. Yeah. Um. Yes. Um, I'm mindful that it's 11.30. I wonder if I might beg everyone's patience for just a little longer because we took a while to get going. Um, is that okay? I might just drift past 11.30 by five or 10 minutes. Can is I just say that uh, I, I'm not the Mark Oakley that wrote Kings and Thieves, as somebody's just asked. That is not you. Okay. No, okay. that's not me. Um, can I ask a brief question, which is not the question I want to end on? And so if somebody else has another question they want to end on, that would be great. Um, the language of church is uh, the poetry of God. 
as you've been saying, but sometimes we get into legis legislative language in our mm -hmm. communion, in our church. I was just talking the other day with the vestry of the cathedral about the fact that sometimes we have to make purely financial decisions and we have to have votes and we have to have procedure and we have to have precision. And then sometimes in the whole overarching um, dynamic of our church, we get stuck in legis legislative binds. Um, and I wonder how the language of love and the poetry of the church interacts with the language of legislation, the language of, um, a, a judicial process. If that's not well, too good a question to ask as we're closing. Well, I would say, first of all, by refusing to allow it to become primary. Yes. Um, you know, God so loved the world that he didn't send a committee. That seems to be quite clear. Um, however, because we're about ordering communities, um, you know, business has to be done, decisions have to be made, accountability has to be in place, and all that. Mm -hmm. But actually, the language of litigation, the language of, um, of, of bureaucracy and, and middle management is not the primary language of the Christian community, which is primarily about relationship um, and deepening relationship and with God, with the self and with each other. Uh, and that means that it's about chemistry as well as laws. And mm -hmm. um, uh, so, yeah, you can give it its place, but it, it's not it's not our native language, it seems to me. Thank you. And I just found the question I want to end on, um, which comes from Patricia Heineke. Um, Today, with all our identities, we have to learn the appropriate language for almost everyone we meet. Mm -hmm. What can poetry teach us about how to slow down and introducing ourselves, greet each other? And I'm going to ask Pat Patricia if you'd like to unmute. I, I just read the question, but um, just make yourself known so that we can see the questioner. Is Patricia Heineke there? I do not see you. Um, well, not seeing Patricia unmuting, I'm just going to say, do you see that question, um, Mark? Or do you want me to read it again? Just read it again to me. And this is perhaps the last question I will ask, um, and I'm thanking Patricia for it. Today, with all our identities, mm -hmm. we have to learn the appropriate language for almost everyone we meet. Mm -hmm. What can poetry teach us about how to slow down and introduce ourselves and greet each other? Poetry and faith have something in common. They distrust first impressions. Uh, Jane Austen, who wrote a famous novel called Pride and Prejudice, was originally going to call it First Impressions. And that's exactly uh, what first impressions can be. It can be full of our pride and full of our prejudice. The thing about poetry is that the space around the words, the, the blankness on the page, is, is equally important to actually the ink. And that's an important part of poetry. It's, it's giving space. It's allowing a, um, not only a reading, but a, a creative hearing uh, um, so that, you know, it's, it's stopping you doing your thinking as you normally do. <laughs> that's why it's difficult sometimes. Poetry is difficult. And the reason it's difficult is because living is difficult. Being human is difficult. Um, and difficulty is a very important spiritual thing, it seems to me, um, uh, because if you look back in your own life, most of those full stops have changed into commas through some difficulty. So we must take difficulty seriously, and poetry will sometimes confront us with our pride and our prejudices and ask us to distrust the first impression and to hear, to look, to sense deeper. That's what poetry will, will offer you as you try to understand 
what it might be like to be somebody other than yourself mm. and to have a glimpse into their identity as well as your own. And when you get people together, as we are now, with their different identities, different personalities and so on, Alice Walker used to say something very beautiful about reading stories, and I, and I think it's the same with poems. She said, you know, I read a poem and I've got my interpretation, then you're going to read the same poem and you have yours and you bring it to the table and I go, oh, wow, I, I've never seen that before. And then somebody else and somebody else, somebody else. And what we end up with is this enormous mountain of insight, which not one of us had on our own. And yet together we've, we've pulled this great big, resource and, and uh, wisdom together that none of us would have had by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, it isn't over. Let's invite somebody else and they're going to add to it. Now, that, that for me is a wonderful image of the Christian community yeah, and how we need each other in order to understand a bit more about God. Um, so, yeah, I, I think poetry has quite a lot to offer um, in, that, in that particular area. Mark, I really appreciate that because you took us full circle. You took us back to the ordinary idea that a poem is never finished. Um, our liturgy is never finished. Our talking of God is never finished. Our building of Christian community is never finished. Um, and I, I, uh, I appreciate that. I want to um, thank Mark on your behalf for sharing so much of himself in the sermon and also in this talk. So yay. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> Um, and I, uh, you know, I think Mark knows, but I'm, I'm deeply grateful for the spiritual place that you've played in my life. And so thank you for that. Um, I am very grateful for advice you've given me over the years and, um, encouragement you've given me, um, cause not everybody does that. Um, so that's, that's been really uh, generous of you. In the chat thread, uh, a number of people have mentioned books by Mark and talked about those books. And we've talked about Amazon. I think somebody found another source for ordering books outside of Amazon and it went into the chat thread. I'm sorry, I haven't been able to read the entire chat thread as we've been going along because there have been so many comments, so many wonderful comments. Um, I hope we captured a flavor of it in the questions that we were able to ask Mark. We're going to save the chat thread though um, and try and make sense of that chat thread and pull some of those resources and, and circulate them to you um, and look and see whether um, we might um, have a conversation about poetry in a book club, perhaps. We can, we can talk about that. I'll talk about that offline with Susan. Um, we've also recorded this uh, and we'll review the, the, the video um, afterwards. And then we want to post this to our um, website so that you can find this conversation again um, and it really has been a wonderful conversation that I've enjoyed immensely. So, Matthew, um, I was just wondering, would, would it be appropriate for me just to end with a short poem? It would be absolutely appropriate. That's exactly okay. what we should do to finish. So I'm going to stop talking um, after uh, Mark's read us um, a final poem. Our meeting will be officially over and uh, I'll let you all drift away. But well, Mark. I thought I, I ought to read an American poet, um, I thought. So I'm going to read um, Mary Oliver. And she wrote uh, this poem, it's called Mysteries, Yes. Truly, we live with mysteries, too marvellous to be understood. How grass can be nourishing in the mouths of lambs. How rivers and stones are forever in allegiance with gravity, while we ourselves dream of rising. How two hands touch and the bonds will never be broken. How people come from delight or the scars of damage to the comfort of a poem. Let me keep my distance always from those who think they have the answers. Let me keep company always with those who say, Look and laugh in astonishment and bow their heads.
Thank you, Mark. And thank you, everybody, for being here. Have a lovely rest of your Sunday, everyone. Mark, you deserve a cocktail now. I'm sorry I can't <laughs> just give you one through the screen, but like, uh, do enjoy one. And, thank you. Uh, thank it's been you great so to be with you all. And I, I hope one, I mean, I do come to the States at least once or twice a year. Maybe I will get to be with you sometime. Come to the West Coast. We can taste wine and then talk about poetry. I would love it. I would love it. Yeah. Thanks, okay. everyone. Farewell. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. you all. Bye.